Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter Twenty Eight. After leaving the sink, we traveled along the Humboldt River a little way. People accustomed to the monster mile-wide Mississippi grow accustomed to associating the term river with a high degree of watery grandeur. Consequently, such people feel rather disappointed when they stand on the shores of the Humboldt or the Carson and find that a river in Nevada is a sickly rivulet which is just the counterpart of the Erie Canal in all respects save that the canal is twice as long and four times as deep. One of the pleasantest and most invigorating exercises one can contrive is to run and jump across the Humboldt River till he is overheated, and then drink it dry. On the fifteenth day we completed our march of two hundred miles and entered Unionville, Humboldt County, in the midst of a driving snowstorm. Unionville consisted of eleven cabins and a liberty pole. Six of the cabins were strung along one side of a deep canyon, and the other five faced them. The rest of the landscape was made up of bleak mountain walls that rose so high into the sky from both sides of the canyon that the village was left, as it were, far down in the bottom of a crevice. It was always daylight on the mountain tops a long time before the darkness lifted and revealed Unionville. We built a small rude cabin in the side of the crevice and roofed it with canvas, leaving a corner open to serve as a chimney, through which the cattle used to tumble occasionally at night and mash our furniture and interrupt our sleep. It was very cold weather, and fuel was scarce. Indians brought brush and bushes several miles on their backs, and when we could catch a laden Indian it was well, and when we could not, which was the rule, not the exception, we shivered and bore it. I confess, without shame, that I expected to find masses of silver lying all about the ground. I expected to see it glittering in the sun on the mountain summits. I said nothing about this, for some instinct told me that I might possibly have an exaggerated idea about it, and so if I betrayed my thought I might bring derision upon myself. Yet I was as perfectly satisfied in my own mind as I could be of anything that I was going to gather up, in a day or two, or at furthest a week or two, silver enough to make me satisfactorily wealthy and so my fancy was already busy with plans for spending this money. The first opportunity that offered, I sauntered carelessly away from the cabin, keeping an eye on the other boys, and stopping and contemplating the sky when they seemed to be observing me. But as soon as the coast was manifestly clear, I fled away as guiltily as a thief might have done, and never halted till I was far beyond sight and call. Then I began my search with a feverish excitement that was brimful of expectation, almost of certainty. I crawled about the ground, seizing and examining bits of stone, blowing the dust from them or rubbing them on my clothes, and then peering at them with anxious hope. Presently I found a bright fragment, and my heart bounded. I hid behind a boulder and polished it and scrutinized it with a nervous eagerness and a delight that was more pronounced than absolute certainty itself could have afforded. The more I examined the fragment, the more I was convinced that I had found the door to fortune. I marked the spot and carried away my specimen. Up and down the rugged mountainside I searched with always increasing interest and always augmenting gratitude that I had come to Humboldt and come in time. Of all the experiences of my life, this secret search among the hidden treasures of Silverland was the nearest to unmarred ecstasy. It was a delirious revel. By and by, in the bed of a shallow rivulet, I found a deposit of shining yellow scales, and my breath almost forsook me. A gold mine, and in my simplicity I had been content with vulgar silver. I was so excited that I half believed my overwrought imagination was deceiving me. Then a fear came upon me that people might be observing me and would guess my secret. Moved by this thought, I made a circuit of the place, and ascended a knoll to reconnoitre. Solitude! No creature was near. Then I returned to my mine, fortifying myself against possible disappointment, but my fears were groundless. The shining scales were still there. I set about scooping them out, and for an hour I toiled down the windings of the stream and robbed its bed, but at last the descending sun warned me to give up the quest, and I turned homeward, laden with wealth. 
As I walked along I could not help smiling at the thought of my being so excited over my fragment of silver when a nobler metal was almost under my nose. In this little time the former had so fallen in my estimation that once or twice I was on the point of throwing it away. The boys were as hungry as usual, but I could eat nothing. Neither could I talk. I was full of dreams and far away. Their conversation interrupted the flow of my fancy somewhat, and annoyed me a little, too. I despised the sordid and commonplace things they talked about, but as they proceeded it began to amuse me. It grew to be rare fun to hear them planning their poor little economies, and sighing over possible privations and distresses, when a gold-mine all our own lay within sight of the cabin, and I could point it out at any moment. Smothered hilarity began to oppress me presently. It was hard to resist the impulse to burst out with exultation and reveal everything. But I did resist. I said within myself that I would filter the great news through my lips calmly, and be serene as a summer morning, while I watched its effect in their faces. I said, "'Where have you all been?' "'Prospecting. What did you find?' "'Nothing.' "'Nothing? What do you think of the country?' "'Can't tell yet,' said Mr. Ballou, who was an old gold-miner, and had likewise had considerable experience among the silver mines. "'Well, haven't you formed any sort of opinion?' "'Yes, a sort of a one. It's fair enough here, maybe, but overrated. Seven thousand dollar ledges are scarce, though. That Sheba may be rich enough, but we don't own it. And besides, the rock is so full of base metals that all the science in the world can't work it. We'll not starve here but we'll not get rich, I'm afraid. So you think the prospect is pretty poor? No name for it. Well, we'd better go back, hadn't we? Oh, not yet. Of course not. We'll try it a riffle first. Suppose now, this is merely a supposition, you know, suppose you could find a ledge that would yield, say, a hundred and fifty dollars a ton. Would that satisfy you? Try us once, from the whole party. Or suppose, merely a supposition, of course, Suppose you were to find a ledge that would yield two thousand dollars a ton. Would that satisfy you? Here, what do you mean? What are you coming at? Is there some mystery behind all this? Never mind. I am not saying anything. You know perfectly well there are no rich mines here. Of course you do. Because you have been around and examined for yourselves. Anybody would know that that has been around. But just for the sake of argument, suppose, in a kind of a general way, Suppose some person were to tell you that two thousand dollar ledges were simply contemptible, contemptible, understand, and that right yonder in sight of this very cabin there were piles of pure gold and pure silver, oceans of it, enough to make you all rich in twenty-four hours. Come. I should say he was as crazy as a loon, said old Balloon, but wild with excitement nevertheless. Gentlemen, said I, I don't say anything. I haven't been around, you know, and of course don't know anything. But all I ask of you is to cast your eye on that, for instance, and tell me what you think of it." And I tossed my treasure before them. There was an eager scramble for it, and a closing of heads together over it under the candlelight. Then Old Blue said, "'Think of it? I think it is nothing but a lot of granite rubbish and nasty glittering mica that isn't worth ten cents an acre.' So vanished my dream. So melted my wealth away. So toppled my airy castle to the earth, and left me stricken and forlorn. Moralizing, I observed, then, that all that glitters is not gold. Mr. Blue said I could go further than that, and lay it up among my treasures of knowledge, that nothing that glitters is gold. So I learned then, once for all, that gold in its native state is but dull, unornamental stuff and that only low-brow metals excite the admiration of the ignorant with an ostentatious glitter. However, like the rest of the world, I still go on underrating men of gold and glorifying men of mica. Commonplace human nature cannot rise above that. End of chapter 28